بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم everyone and welcome to the Celebrate Mercy webinar the opening session of Black Lives Around the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم and uh, we are just uh, opening the virtual door doors um, for everyone to join us inshallah um, we are streaming this um, primarily on YouTube, but also on Facebook, on various pages. And um, it looks like people are starting to enter right now. Um, as you're joining us, inshallah, uh, post something in the comments. Let us know um, where you are joining us from today. Let us know where you're joining from. Uh, are you watching by yourself? Are you watching with family? Um, is this your first Celebrate Mercy webinar? Let us know in the comments and we'll share some of your uh, responses here, inshallah, on the screen. Um, we would love to know where you're tuning in from around the world, uh, inshallah. And Sara, you can uh, share some of the responses uh, that people are, are typing, inshallah. I see, mashallah, Oakland, California, looking at my other screen here, Chicago from Brother Hamza, Richmond, Virginia, Mashallah, Lexington, Kentucky. First time from Connecticut. Great, welcome. Mashallah, Philly. First timer. Mashallah, welcome, welcome. Uh, from New York City. Mashallah, Sister Yvette. Uh, Buffalo, watching with family. Pakistan. Mashallah. Atlanta. Everyone is kind of typing in the comments where they're tuning in from. Are you watching with family? Uh, is this your first time joining a Celebrate Mercy program? Um, mashallah, first session with Celebrate Mercy, but my third virtual meeting today. Yes, it is the COVID era. <laughs> We're jumping from Zoom to Zoom, right? Uh, Irvine, mashallah. It's great to see so many people joining uh, multiple states, multiple countries. Indonesia, mashallah. New Jersey. So we see a lot of people joining from the United States. I saw Pakistan. I saw Indonesia. Any other countries as well outside of the United States joining? Mashallah, joining from Bahrain. Uh, Sister Cheryl, mashallah, second Celebrate Mercy session. Mimi from North Carolina. Great. It's great to see everyone joining. Mashallah, Indonesia. That's great. Um, we want to welcome everyone. Uh, I see someone joining from India as well. We have multiple countries, multiple continents. Um, this program today is being hosted by Celebrate Mercy, and we are a nonprofit organization that teaches about the life and character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How do we do that? We do that through our webinars, social media posts. Um, we do traveling conferences. Although you know now with COVID, we haven't done a lot of that. Um, we, we do Umrah trips uh, and trips to Jerusalem, and we do campaigns. We, we say that we teach about the Prophet Sallallahu through our words and through our actions, through the programs and through the campaigns, alhamdulillah. And since um, you know, the era, the COVID era, um, we have done so many different programs and campaigns. Since March of last year, uh, when COVID started to spread in the USA rapidly, um, we have put out over 330 hours of content within 10 months, alhamdulillah. Um, and we hope that you all have uh, been able to join some of those programs. Many of it, uh, many of those programs are on our YouTube channel. Um, we've done weekly webinars like Friday Gems, and later on we'll announce who will be joining us this Friday for the Friday Gems programs. Um, we've done campaigns uh, during um, this COVID era as well. Many of you all have donated generously to those campaigns uh, as well. Um, and uh, we have done um, webinars, a lot of one-time webinars as well. You may recognize some of these flyers from uh, one-time webinars that we've done um, as well. So we hope that you benefited from them and you can catch a lot of these on our YouTube channel, um, as I said before. Um, and one reminder to everyone watching on YouTube is uh, please try to hit the like button if you're enjoying today's program, you're excited about today's program. Um, that means more people will see today's program. The more people who like it, the more people who see it on their YouTube feed. 
Um, and subscribe while you're at it so that you stay in the loop. You can also click on the bell to be notified of any future webinars and live streams, inshallah. And lastly, before we get started, we want to encourage you all to share today's program. Today's program is free. It's open to the public. We encourage you to in invite your friends. If you go on our uh, Celebrate Mercy social media, um, you find this Live Now flyer. We've tweeted it. We've posted it on Instagram, on Facebook. So share it, inshallah. We say sharing is sharing at Celebrate Mercy. Um, the more people who join, and maybe they're encouraged by you to join. If they benefit today, if it increases their iman, increases their love for the Prophet, them, then you get a share of those blessings, inshallah. I'm now going to introduce Ustad Hassan Fai, who will, inshallah, be reciting from the Holy Quran as we open up today's program. Uh, Ustad Hassan was born in the Gambia. He moved to the U.S. at the age of 10, became a hafiz at the age of 13 at Darul Ulum in Atlanta, Georgia. At the age of 21, he enrolled in a year-long intensive Arabic program at Bayana, uh, mashallah, and after completing that program, returned to Atlanta. He's now a teacher of the Quran of Hifth, uh, a youth leader, offers youth counseling throughout the local masajid in Atlanta, and he's pr currently pursuing a master's in counseling and psychology. So we're very honored to have Ustad Hassan with us, a great teacher, a great brother, uh, mashallah, and um, we urge you to also follow him on social media where he's always posting beautiful recitations of the Quran and, and dhikrs, um, and inshallah, we hope you, you stay connected with him. Uh, Ustad Hassan, we're honored to have you with us, and the stage is now yours. Barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء لله شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين إن يكن غنيا أو فقيرا فالله أولى بهما فلا تتبع الهوى أن تعدلوا وَإِن تَلْوُوا أَوْ تُعْرِضُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرًا صدق الله العظيم جزاكم الله 
الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام جزاك الله خير أستاذ حسن and we uh, we are, we're grateful to uh, to have you with us honored to have you with us and we hope you can join us in the future again إن شاء الله إن شاء الله جزاكم الله خير for having me السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله and uh, Ustad Hassan, as we said, is uh, very active on social media, always posting beautiful recitations. We hope you'll stay connected with him on uh, Instagram and, and Facebook as well, inshallah. Um, I'm now going to, let me share my slides real quick here, bismillah. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Sheikh Mohammed Adeyinka Mendez, who will be joining us uh, actually multiple times during today's program. And take note uh, at the top of the slide there, you see that we have a hashtag for today's program. We would love if you can post on social media, you know, if you hear an inspirational quote, if something today inspires you, you hear something beautiful, you wanna post maybe a picture of your family as they're watching today's program, we will be retweeting you. Uh, and sharing on our Instagram story um, the lessons that you learned. Just make sure to use the hashtag Black Sahaba um, and uh, tag Celebrate Mercy, and we'll be monitoring to uh, share some of your tweets. And maybe we can even share a couple of them during the live program as well. Um, Sheikh Mohammed Adin Mendez is the uh, primary and main teacher of this 10 part series um, that is launching right now with this opening session. We've also been blessed to have him um, teach at multiple Celebrate Mercy programs, including a, another class that we'll talk about later that's, go, that's ongoing um, you know, these past few weeks. Um, and he's also been working on an amazing book translation that we'll talk about a little later too and encourage you all to pre-order that book, uh, inshallah. But let me formally introduce him now before he gives some introductory remarks. Um, Imam Adiyinka Mendez is the founder of the Bilal Spiritual Center for Peace, the Arts, uh, and the Arts, and sorry, Peace, the Arts, and Consciousness, and co-founder of the African American Healing, Ancestry, and Development Collective, Ahad Collective. He is an educator, author, translator of sacred literature, and spiritual activist who's traveled the world studying Quranic exegesis or tafsir prophetic narrations, ahadith, classical Arabic, theology, sacred jurisprudence, you know, fiqh, contemplative arts, and the science of spiritual illumination with living masters. He's been teaching these and other sacred sciences since 2001 and speaks internationally on Quranic spirituality, youth and adult rites of passage, peace building, and the healing wisdom of black Muslim cultures and civilizations. Sheikh Mendez is a recipient of the Center for Global Muslim Life 2020 Spiritual Impact Award, and his latest work, The Spirits of Black Folk, Sages Through the Ages, is due to be released in February 2021, which is when, which is right now. This is February 2021. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that book release uh, later. And uh, Sheikh Mendez lives with his wife, Ustad uh, Rukayat Yaqub, an author and educator, and their children in New Jersey. Uh, Sheikh Mendez, uh, we're honored to have you with us, and the stage is now yours. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much for that gracious invitation. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alamin. Wa sallallahu ala Nabi Kareem wa alihi wa sahbi wa ala sallil anbiya wa mursaleen wa sallam taslima, which means we begin always seeking the blessing of God, His name, the name of God, and the most loving, the uh, eternally compassionate. All praise and thanks belong to the divine reality. And we ask that he send blessings and peace upon our beloved leader, our guide, our teacher, Muhammad, and his family and his companions, and all of the prophets and all the messengers and all who follow them. Uh, I'm very excited about tonight's inaugural session of our newly expanded black lives around the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. God bless him and grant him peace course. I want to thank Allah again. I want to thank the entire Celebrate Mercy team. Uh, I want to thank the countless uh, people, scholars, imams, chaplains, uh, friends that have uh, been helping me behind the scenes uh, develop this material and with the translation and the revision and the editing and the proofreading of the book uh, that I hope will uh, really be a, a, a blessing and a healing 
for not just Muslims, but for human beings around the world. Uh, two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, we saw the capital of the United States full of people who, um, many of them, uh, many of them were carrying uh, paraphernalia, Confederate flags that um, show a time in our history when racial relations were even worse, uh, much worse than they are now. We have made progress, but we still have a long way to go. And so I've seen in my own life and, and the, the numerous emails I've gotten, text messages uh, talking about the last course and what a difference, what an impact they made on people's lives, uh, that, that this knowledge is was something that people need and it, and it changes it changes hearts, it opens minds. And it's only through knowledge and developing relationships that racism can be eliminated and eradicated from hearts. And I'll just say one last thing before I allow my, my respected, beloved wife to say a few words. Uh, any, if you haven't heard of Daryl Davis, look him up. He is an African-American man who attends KKK rallies. And, the, and, and his attend, he has a TED talk on attending KKK rallies and how he developed a friendship with the Grand Wizard, one of, of the KKK. And that relationship, remember I said knowledge and relationships will, is what will change our world for the better. That relationship ended up in that KKK leader leaving the KKK, taking off his hood and renouncing white supremacy. And with that, uh, I'd like my wife, Roke Yaqub, who is a teacher, an educator, and, a, and an author, to say a few words about the difference this uh, material about Black Muslim nobles has made in her life and in, in her work. Assalamu alaikum. Mashallah, what an honor to be here. Um, SubhanAllah, thank you again um, to the Great Mercy for doing this, for putting this uh, seminar, this webinar together so that we can benefit from these stories that we don't often hear about. And for me as an educator, I in try to incorporate these type of stories into the stories that I share with my children, but also in the workshops that I do. And I find that children have a great interest in these things. They want to know more. They want to know, you know, as much as they can about the Prophet Islam, but also those amazing individuals that Allah Allah has gifted us to, to, to know them and to, for them to be around him. They're part of the, the, the gift that the Prophet is to us, is those people, because we get to understand him more by seeing how he interacted with those people. So when we tell these stories, I tell these stories, when I incorporate into my lessons, it, it gives a whole nother, it gives another depth to the uh, to these um to what they're learning and the children just they they love it subhanallah and I'd love to see our Islamic schools weekend and full time schools all over the country and other parts of the world really incorporate this sort of information into the into the curriculum so that our children grow up with it and it just becomes natural for them to understand these things so the next generation doesn't just think there's just one you know black Sahabi and, and that's the end of the story <laughs> so alhamdulillah thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the, the scholars that will be joining us. And I ask all of you in conclusion, think of five people that you can share a link with. Think of five people you can invite uh, and, and spread the word. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Mendez and Ustad Ruqayat and uh, we will be sharing also um, a book that uh, a book for children that Ustada Ruqayat uh, authored um, about Sheikh Ahmed Ubamba and um, where you can order that a really beautiful book that children can color as well and learn uh, and um, and she teaches classes as well so we encourage you to definitely uh, stay connected with her on social media and we will be hearing from Sheikh Mendez later in today's program as he's going to actually formally go into the book, into the book that we will be studying for, the, for, for this month, for the next nine sessions after today. Um, he will share one of the stories of the uh, black Sahaba, uh, black companions around the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will be starting the book actually tonight. Um, and we're gonna hear some amazing introductory remarks and um, inspirational stories from our other teachers as well, by the way. Later on in today's program, we will also have a Q&A session. So if you have questions as you hear the teachers speak, note them down. You can share your questions in the comments. Um, you can also email us 
Um, uh, if you want your question to remain anonymous, you can email us at info at celebratemercy.com. That's info at celebratemercy.com. We also just want to shout out, you know, and thank um, LaunchGood because LaunchGood is one of our publicity partners for today's program. LaunchGood is streaming today's program on their own pages as well. So we're very grateful to that. And they have a great program also going on during Black History Month that we will share with you a little bit later and encourage you to join their programming during this February, during Black History Month as well. So thank you to Launch Good. We also wanna thank Imam Zaid Shakir and his team because they're streaming this program live on his Facebook page as well. So we have people joining from all sorts of different directions, alhamdulillah, and it's a big blessing to have the community support for this program. Um, so we are going to now go to our next speaker, inshallah, and that is Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans. Um, and, and we are, you know, he's, he's no stranger to Celebrate Mercy programs. We've had him multiple times, an amazing teacher, uh, one of my teachers, and an amazing scholar, um, and an amazing speaker in general, uh, mashallah. Um, let me now introduce him. Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans is the first scholar in residence at the American Learning Institute for Muslims, Alam. He converted to Islam while in high school. And upon converting, Ustad Ubaidullah began studying some of the foundational books of Islam under the private tutelage of local scholars while simultaneously pursuing a degree in journalism from Columbia University. Since then, he studied at Chicagoland's Institute of Islamic Education, IIE, in Tarim, Yemen, and at Al Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt, where he became one of the first African Americans to graduate from. Al Azhar's Sharia program. He also teaches with the Talif Collective and the Inner City Muslim Action Network. We're very honored to have uh, Sheikh Abedullah join us for the webinar and later for the Q and A. Inshallah, and Sheikh Abedullah, the stage is now yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the Hamda lillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nastahdi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته it is a great honor and a great privilege uh, to be in such a, a beautiful assembly and to be with such beautiful company uh, at the beginning of what i anticipate will be a beautiful program i want to thank uh, Tariq you know El Masidi um, a brother who never ceases to amaze me uh, with his thoughtfulness, his sensitivity, his creativity, and his vision. Um, I want to thank all of the other presenters, um, all of the other students, because I myself will be a student for this course uh, that are tuning in this evening. Um, this is um, really special for me, and I, I hope that in the short time that I've been allotted, I can explain a little bit about why, um, you know, Early into my Islam, uh, I encountered a brother who was at great pains, right, to point out that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been black, right? He would, uh, every week after Salatul Jum'ah, after the congregational prayer, he would give us, you know, different reading materials. He would refer us to books and he was adamant about this. And one day, I was sitting with one of my teachers who is a black man, and I was asking him about this. I was asking about the complexion of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi wasalam, And he said to me, Ubaidullah, be very careful with this. I said, why? He said, I'm not saying that it's unimportant, nor am I saying that there isn't investigation that needs to be done there, because there is. But we must understand that prophethood is a Wahhabi phenomenon, right? When people talk about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being black, they might, not necessarily, but they might intend that blackness is so great, right? That it has not only produced great philosophers and great statesmen and women, and great physicians and great artists and great poets and great leaders and great warriors. Blackness has also produced prophets. 
And he said, prophethood is a wahbi phenomenon. It's something that is given by God. Blackness does not produce prophets, right? And we, we have to be very careful of that. And I looked a little bit dismayed because as somebody black in America, I do, and I say so uh, without reservation, I am very interested in issues of race, ethnicity, and complexion. That perhaps is a part of my context. He said, but however, to tell people things that help to broaden their cognitive frames, that help to, to deepen and to enhance and to enrich their understanding of the possibility of blackness in black people. This is a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Setting aside this historical debate about his complexion, broadening people's cognitive frames with regard to how they see blackness. This is a sunnah of the Prophet And I'm there looking shocked, maybe like you're looking right now. And he said, when the Prophet elected Bilal as his mu'adhin, there was some pushback to that. Some people said that his nutq, you know, his pronunciation, his enunciation, of Arabic, you know, left something to be desired. But the Prophet Sallallahu was adamant about this being for him, radiallahu anh. And even after the Fath of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ commanding Bilal, who was occupying at that time the most visible public post within the Muslim community to take his place atop this sacred symbol that was venerated by all of the Arab, the Muslim and the non-Muslim, and to call the believers to prayer. This was the coronation of not only Bilal, but Islam. And of course, it expanded their frames in terms of what they understood about the possibility of blackness. However, as Sheikh Muhammad alluded to in the remarks that were given before my own, it would be in his uh, blessed wife, Ustad Ruqayyat, it would be a misnomer. It would be a mistake to assume that it was just Bilal, right? No, even when people talk about a black contribution to Islam, I counter by saying there was no black contribution to Islam because Islam in part has always been black. You've always had people that were a part of the African diaspora that made up the early community of Muslims. Many of our forebearers, the Salaf al-Salih, were people that hailed from East Africa, people that hailed from North Africa. So this has always been part and parcel, a part of who we are. But if we've allowed the current context to diminish the respect, to diminish the esteem, to diminish the veneration that we have for this aspect of our community, then I certainly hope that these sessions will help to restore that esteem. That's what I'm hoping to get out of this, that they will help to restore that esteem. And it's important to remember that there is nothing inherent to blackness that is always disadvantaged, nor is there anything inherent to blackness that is always in need of special advocacy. No, it is us, right, particularly North Americans that have this impoverished view of a subset of God's creation. And God has spread his favor and his blessing throughout his creation, giving certain talents and certain kinds of cultural genius and certain kinds of mazaya, special characteristics to people throughout his creation. And if you are imprisoned or enthralled to a kind of anti-blackness that prevents your seeing that, know that your view of not only black people is impoverished, but your view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is impoverished. They have grossly underestimated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, you know, in conclusion, um, subhanAllah, you know, um, I'm thinking about this story. And every time I think about this session, this, 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 this set of lectures and the book that our blessed Sheikh Adi Inka 
will be walking us through slowly and gently. I'm always thinking about Banu Arafidah, those companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam radiallahu anhum jami'an, who on the day of Eid were celebrating in the masjid of the Prophet wasalam, by doing these choreographed kind of military style exercises. And they were saying, Muhammadun nafsun tayyiba. Muhammad is a pure soul, right? And because they were moving in this choreographed way, Sayyidina Omar was taken aback by this. And he thought that there was something uh, 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 profane, right? There was something profane about this taking place in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And he started to throw pebbles at them, not stones. It's, it, it irritates me when people attribute all manner of barbarity to Sayyidina Omar. Not a sakhra, but husat, yani. Small pebbles, mostly to get their attention. And he started to, you know, indicate to them with, with ishara to get, get out of here. Don't do that. Don't do that. And the Prophet, alayhi wasalam, stopped him and said, Omar, leave them. And in another riwayah, he said, Banu Arfida, show us your moves. Raise your voices in celebration because I want people to know that there is a place for levity in this great religion. In a sense, honoring them and esteeming their specificities because the Prophet ﷺ had no impoverished view of God. And that is what we aim to attain through these sessions. So um, I'm very happy to be with you. Um, I anticipate this being... Uh, uh, not only a, an eye opener, but a mind blower. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me space to address uh, this blessed assembly. Jazakum Allah khudah khayr wa salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Jazakum Allah khayr, Sheikh Abedullah. And Sheikh Abedullah will be also joining us um, later in the program as we have the Q&A session, inshallah. Um, and so as you hear these talks, as I said before, note down your questions. You can post them in the comments. Um, and you can also email, if you want your question to remain anonymous, you can email info at celebratemercy.com. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A later in the program, uh, mashallah. And uh, this is, as you know, the opening session, free public opening session of a 10-part series that starts tonight. So. Some of you may not have registered yet for the class, the 10-part the, 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 the series that's going to start, that which is starting right now. Um, it is going to be on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays throughout the month of February. Um, and the next session will actually start next Tuesday. Um, so we have one today on Wednesday. Um, the next one will be Tuesday. And then ongoing after that, it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, inshallah. And this is a free class. There is a suggested donation, but it's not required. So we hope that some of you joining, inshallah, tonight for this opening session will be encouraged and inspired to, to register for the full 10-part series, uh, inshallah. Um, and also just a reminder, um, we hope th those of you watching on YouTube can uh, click on the like button. Um, help more people see this video by liking the video and subscribing to Celebrate Mercy on YouTube. And just a reminder to please encourage friends to join us right now. SubhanAllah, this has been one of our biggest, I can see the numbers right now. This has been one of our biggest uh, webinars we've done since last year. Um, there are almost 1,000 computers and devices connected and watching today's program. Many of you watching as families. So there are literally probably two or 3,000 people watching right now. Um, and maybe that can hit 1,000, but we need your help. Inform your friends that they can join us at celebratemercy.com slash be live. Celebratemercy.com slash be live. We've posted this on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can WhatsApp it to your friends, signal it to your friends, telegram it to your friends, and encourage them to join us. As you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Whoever encourages someone to do a good deed or, or, or guides someone to do a good deed, it is as if you performed that good deed. So you, you're watching, you're benefiting today, but your uh, retweet or your share may bring more people to today's program. And it's going to be like you got the reward of seven people watching.
today's program, benefiting, learning about the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and increasing in their Iman, inshallah. So uh, it's not just a share or retweet, but it could be a multiplication of barakah, uh, barakah for you, inshallah, and, uh, a bar barakah jariya, inshallah. Um, I'm now going to introduce Sheikh Aisha Prime, who will be our next speaker on today's program. Uh, she is also someone who's been uh, teaching at multiple Celebrate Mercy programs in the past. Mashallah, whenever we have Sheikh Aisha at our programs, we we can we can see a huge increase in the numbers of people who join because Mashallah, so many people love her and her lessons and her teachings. Mashallah, she is really a blessing to our Ummah. Mashallah. Sheikh Aisha Prime converted to Islam more than 20 years ago. She studied in Egypt at the Fajr Institute, later moved to Yemen and enrolled in an Islamic university there for women. She's most passionate about combining Islamic studies, cultural art and activism and service for the purpose of training leaders. She served as a director of women's affairs at Dar al Hijra Islamic Center in Virginia and is co-founder and executive director of Baraka Inc., an organization committed to training Muslim women in traditional Islamic sciences. She now serves as a scholar in residence and associate chaplain at ICNYU in New York City. Sheikh Aisha is a proud wife and mother of three children. Uh, we're honored to have you with us, Sheikh Aisha, and the stage is now yours. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you so much, Sidi Tariq. I am honored as always to be a part of this program with Celebrate Mercy. I just want to thank uh, Sheikh Adin Kamendez as well as his wife, Alhamdulillah Sheikh Rakaya, for joining us on this program. Honestly, it just, it, it only, as the night goes on, it only gets better. Ustad Obedullah Evans, may Allah continue to preserve him and just continue to raise his rank and ennoble his face. He spoke so eloquently as he always does, which is such a high level of intelligence uh, about in-depth the you know the depth of this topic and so it just made me even more excited of course to be a student uh in this program um looking forward to that to being able to just sit and learn from these mubarak teachers may allah subhanahu ta'ala continue to bless us to be able to learn and to benefit from them you know our one of uh, a great activist for racial justice and for the empowerment of particularly of African-American women, Ida B. Wells said, the method by which to right a wrong is to shine light upon, it is to shine light upon it. And so in, when I think about this statement by Ida B. Wells, like the way to right a wrong is you gotta shine a light on it. This is exactly what the Prophet did, not only for his time, but all the way into the end of time. Just like his birth was a, a means of which light extended far into the north and the east and to the west, it extended into his time. It actually shed light upon the past and then it would shed a light even into the racial injustices that we are that we're going through right now today and the methodology the path forward for how to address and to right these wrongs and so when we look at the prophet and in this in his prophetic example not only did he center these lives and center these narratives but they they were active foundational members of his community and this is something that sheikh ubaidullah he just mentioned in terms of the black contribution that there is no black contribution you're not just a mere drop as a poster you're a foundational member of the prophetic community even before that right and so subhanallah when we look at um, when we look at the proof even of the Prophet because what a Prophet has to do, and especially when you're when they're khatib and nabiyin, when you're the seal of the Prophets, is how are you going to bring a miracle into the world that's going to be a benefit for the people today? And when we look at the level of sickness that the idea of white supremacy has brought, when we look at the 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 weight of of its impact and 
in terms of how deeply it has also reached inside the Muslim community, inside of the psyche, and even into the way that we understand text and have contextualized the Sahaba, as our great teacher, uh, Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans, he just mentioned, like you, it's, it's impoverished us in our relationship with Allah. It has literally affected our aqidah. And so in understanding that the Prophet would bring about a message and bring about a methodology that would be so healing to solve this problem of racial inequality, but how do we move forward as a community of wisdom, a community of light that shines light into this darkness? How do we move forward into healing? We find that example in the Prophet so first, in addressing in just through revelation, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is said to have created Adam, right? That, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he took a handful, his handful of clay, of a hand, a handful of earth, and that he then brought that into Jannah, right? To create our first uh, father, Adam, alayhi salam. And in understanding that first Adam, you know, having one of its meanings is that it's a black um, that is black, um, black sounding clay or black sounding mud. And so it being also, a, 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 it can be used as a term for skin color that already the Quran, this revelation begins to be a huge insight into our psyche. It begins to be a huge healing for us to be able to have to address some of our own um leniencies or tendencies towards the way that we see color and through our ability to look at revelation in such a light then we have to shine the light inside our own hearts and say why why do i struggle with this if i do or not right what challenges am i finding with it and then how have i not been an advocate for that truth right not just like i'm not racist or not even an anti-racist but how do i be an advocate for the truth inside of the Islamic context, which can then be a means of calling many who left Islam, honestly, or who were afraid to come to the door of Islam, afraid that Islam was actually an injustice uh, to black people, to blackness, and endorsed certain harms or oppression. And so by having this class, what we're doing is righting a great wrong that has been done historically over time. And that is a great, uh, a great deal of erasure and a great deal of lies that have been told about, about our Prophet and have been told about our deen. And the biggest way to do it is to center these narratives with this scholarship that Celebrate Mercy has brought forth. And so with that, when we look at the Prophet and we look at all of the relationship in his life, his not only his advocacy for and hifad fulul, his allyship with Asmaha, uh, King Nagashi, not only his, his friends and his companions who he built community with, built Masajid with, who he built um, Dina with who he fought in battle with, who he bled with, who he prayed with, who he cried with, who he's looking forward to enter and entering into Jannah with when we tell the stories of Bilal, subhanAllah, who he elevated, sorry, who he elevated, subhanAllah, all of these are, are just witnesses for the truth and the healing power of this deen. As the Sheikh Ubaidullah in closing, gave that story about how the Prophet not only uh, you know, was in community, with, but gave space for the culture and elevated the culture by allowing this to happen inside of his masjid. We're just in for a wonderful, wonderful, healing, expansive ride, by which in the end, we're going to be able to become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by rectifying this wrong and increasing in wisdom through us understanding these stories. So jazakum la khair, jazakum la al khair, celebrate mercy for holding this program and looking so forward to being a student of Sheikh Mendez and his wife and all of the teachers who are part of it. Jazakum Allah khair. Thank you so much, Sheikha Aisha, and we're, we're honored to have you. And uh, she will also be joining us, inshallah, um, in the future as we have this series of 10 lessons, inshallah. Uh, you can see Sheikha Aisha, some of the comments, mashallah. Uh, we encourage you all to share your comments here on uh, YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, so many people have been commenting and 
we have a very active audience, mashallah. So uh, we're very honored to have you with us, Sheikh Aisha, and we're excited to have you back um, uh, to give some guest, uh, you know, talks during this uh, series, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Congratulations on this new on this new series. Alhamdulillah. 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 And that is, you know, alhamdulillah, that is one of the things that is different. We had this class last year with Sheikh Mendez, but what's different about this one is alhamdulillah, um, it is expanded. Um, last time was seven sessions, this time it's 10 sessions. Uh, last time we didn't have as much time to bring in guest lecturers, guest speakers. Um, to give some beautiful inspirational talks during the series. Now we will be adding more of those inspirational talks. We'll be adding more time for questions and answers. There'll be more content and new content. So this class is not going to be a replica or a, you know, a copy of last year's. It's going to be expanded, more exciting, more interactive. That's why we hope you all will register for these classes that are coming up on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Sundays in the evenings. Uh, inshallah, uh, going forward. And the link to register is, and by the way, it's a free class. There's a suggested donation, but it's free. CelebrateMercy.com slash BL. CelebrateMercy.com slash BL. I'm now going to introduce uh, Imam Dawood Walid, uh, who we're very honored to have with uh, with us today for the program and for the Q&A, of course. Um, and uh, he will be speaking about a very important topic as we are just about to open the book and go into the content that Sheikh Mendez will, will share. And we also have Imam Omar Suleiman coming and Imam Zaid Shakir and the questions and answers as well. Imam Dawood Walid is currently the executive director of the Michigan chapter of CARE. Uh, he has studied under qualified scholars at disciplines, the disciplines of Arabic grammar and morphology, the foundations of Islamic jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh, the sciences of the tafsir or exegesis of the Quran and Islamic history. He's also lectured at over 50 institutions of higher learning about Islam, interfaith dialogue, and social justice, including at Harvard, DePaul University, and the University of the Virgin Islands. He previously served as an imam at Masjid Wali Muhammad in Detroit. Do we have any Michiganders in the house? I just learned that term recently, Michiganders. Uh, if you're from Michigan, let us know. He served previously as an imam at Masjid Wali Muhammad in Detroit and the Bosnian American Islamic Center in Hamtramck, Michigan, and continues to deliver sermons and lectures at Islamic centers across the United States and Canada. We're very honored to have Imam Dawood uh, Walid with us, and Imam Dawood, the stage is now yours. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatli ma uglika wa khatli ma sabaqa nasa bilhaq bilhaq wa hadi ila siratika al-mustakeem wa ala alihi haqan qarihi maqdar al-azim wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. First of all, to the uh, Celebrate Mercy team and uh, Sheikh Mendez, Ustadha, uh, Ruqayya, uh, congratulations on this uh, class. And also uh, shout out to my uh, my brother Ustadha Bayla Evans and to uh, my sister, my dear sister, Ustadha Aisha Prime, who I've been involved in teaching this subject matter uh, before on other platforms. Um, one thing that I want to touch on in regards to this evening session, as it relates to uh, the upcoming classes, as well as uh, Sheikh Mendez's book, uh, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, is actually that there is an unknown to many Muslims, there's actually a genre of Muslim texts that are talk that talk about Black history, and this isn't some new genre that came about because of Black Lives Matter movement or protests in the street or some sort of uh, postmodern construct about how racism needs to be challenged. Uh, in fact, this genre of highlighting Black excellence goes beyond one thousand years in the Islamic discourse, 1,000 years. So we have tracked down that there are no less than 12 Muslim texts that have been written specifically and solely about recognizing black excellence. The first of these going back, all the way back to the time of the early imams 
And the first one that we see or we know about was written uh, was written during the era of when Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, uh, lived uh, during the time in the Khilafah of Al Ma'mun Al Abbasi during this time period. So, uh, within this genre, I want to highlight uh, a couple of books in particular, but the scholars who wrote about this subject matter, these just aren't obscure scholars. So, the first of those who is uh, famous or perhaps infamous who wrote a treatise on this issue. Uh, during the lifetime of Imam Ahmed is a, uh, was a black Iraqi scholar by the name of El Jahid. El Jahid uh, literally means the one with, uh, with big eyes. Uh, he wrote a, um, a, uh, a treatise. It's been translated in English called The Glory of the Blacks. Uh, the title is somewhat problematic, but it is uh, titled Fakhr Sudan Ala Baydan is the literal title of the book. From this, there were a number of titles of books that were written, and I will get to the reason why after I mention some of the titles. But two of these uh, very well-known scholars who wrote on this subject, this genre of highlighting Black excellence, uh, one of those who was well-known and beloved, actually, he's one of my most favorite scholars in the Islamic tradition, a descendant of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Ibn al Jawzi al Hanbali, Rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. He wrote an epic book. It's titled Tanwir Ghabish fi Fali Sudan wa Habish. And this book basically uh, we can translate it as illuminating the darkness or, alludin, or illuminating the ignorance as it relates to the virtues of the blacks and the Abyssinians. So this is one book that was written by a great Hanbali a polymath that specifically talked about the excellence of blackness, even highlighting uh, prophets and friends of God, such as Luqman alayhi uh, salam, uh, who were black, who were black men. Uh, so this is one. The other scholar is the well-known, very famous Jalahuddin as suyuti rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, who was a polymath in his own right. He wrote three books actually, on this particular subject of highlighting the excellence of blackness. Uh, one of those in which uh, Sheikh Mendes, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, will explain uh, or talk about more, which is a the basis of the book uh, that he wrote is Rafu Shan al Shan, that is highlighting or uh, showing the, the, the prominence of, of black people, right? Uh, and actually, a, a, a note for you that uh, as Suyuti was actually, though he was Persian in lineage, lived in Egypt, but he was married to a um, to a Habashia woman, to a uh, an Ethiopian or to a Nubian a woman. That's a little uh, fact that a lot of people don't know about as Suyuti. Beyond these 12 books that were written in Arabic in the classic time, in the old time specifically about the merits or excellence of blackness, we have many other books in which great scholars and polymaths narrate traditions or discussed in short chapters specifically about the eminence and excellence of blackness. One of them, the great polymath Ibn Qutayba, rahmatullahi ta'ala, in his book, Ayyuna al Akhbar, he has a chapter called The Chapter of the Women. It's in the fourth Jews. I, I have the book in my library in Babu Nisa. And he has a special sub chapter specifically about Asawad talking about the merits of black women in particular, subhanAllah, that this man, he's, he's not of any black ancestry and he wrote a specific sub chapter in the chapter about the merits of women, but he wrote something specific about the black woman. Now, why even have this, right? We know that our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said li kulli da'in dua that for every disease there is a cure. So there's two reasons why scholars wrote these books and these chapters back in the day and they have contemporary relevance today. So Ibn al-Jawzi for instance, the reason why he wrote his book is that he came across some of the most pious people in, in Damascus of his time. And these were Ethiopian people. And he found themselves 
to be involved in self-loathing or inferiority complexes because they have been put down because of their blackness in Sham. So Ibn al Jalzi left, he saw this going on, and he wrote a book and he handed it to the to the Fudala of the Ahbash, of the great noble virtuous men and women. And he handed them copies of this book and said, read this. So this was a type of remedy in relationship to their black, uh, their black self-loathing of their inferiority complexes due to anti-black racism in Syria. Now, the other reason why the book was written is to help cure those who aren't black or to give them some tip or give them a medicine to help them deal with their implicit anti-blackness that had come across that people had seen in Persian society and in Arab society. And this is the occasions about why these books were written and why this was highlighted back in those times. And we hope that through uh, this great work that Celebrate Mercy is doing, the scholarship of, of Sheikh Mendes and also uh, Sidi um, uh, Talut uh, uh, Daoud, uh, who also uh, helped with the, uh, the project, that uh, this class in his book will also help as medicines to help restore and help with the uh, inferiority complexes that maybe some of us have as Black people who are Muslims, and also to highlight and show the eminence and the grand stature uh, of Muslims who are uh, from the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that many Muslims who are not Black aren't aware of. And with that, uh, I conclude, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, guide us uh, by his light towards him. Wa afwa minkum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair, Imam Dawood. Um, it's always an honor to have you with us, and we will we look forward to having you for the Q and A session coming up uh, uh, in a bit. And, and I'd love to also mention that Imam Dawood um, wrote the foreword uh, for the book. We have uh, the foreword by Imam Dawood. We also have an essay by uh, Sheikh Abdullah Evans um, for the book, um, and he just mentioned the book Raf um, Roshan al Hubshan. Um, by Imam Suyuti, and that is the book that many of you actually helped donate so that we could have a translation of that book in English, a good translation of the book in English. So um, I'd like to go ahead and encourage you. We actually have just opened pre-orders for the book. Um, the book cover is actually not going to look like this. This was an initial design of the book uh, cover. We actually have a new design coming up. But the book is actually going to start printing this month. It will be shipped out by the end of February, inshallah. Um, by the end of this class, many of you will start to receive the, the translation book uh, in the mail, um, inshallah. So where can you learn more about it? Where can you order? Where can you learn more about this class that we're doing? Um, you can go to celebratemercy.com slash BL. That is kind of the, the, the main link where you can register for this uh, class of 10 uh, a, a, the series of 10 classes. Uh, inshallah, um, there's also this code, this coupon code where you can save 5%. There's an option to get pretty low cost um, expedited shipping as well. Some of you who donated to this project will also get signed copies by uh, Sheikh Mendez as well. And we'll share a little bit later how you can donate towards this project because this is just the beginning. There's gonna be two more books on this topic coming out, including a children's book and we need your help to make that happen, uh, inshallah, going forward. So uh, inshallah, we, we just wanna remind you to still you know, invite your friends to join us. Um, this class, is, this, this, this you know, program right now is streaming. And mashallah, we have uh, over 950 devices connected to us on Facebook, on YouTube. It's streaming on Imam Zaid's uh, Facebook page, on Launch Goods Facebook page. Celebrate Mercy's Facebook page on Celebrate Mercy's YouTube page. So encourage your friends to join us uh, because we still have, mashallah, uh, Sheikh Mendez, who's going to be uh, sharing a brief story from the book itself. We have Imam Zaid, we have uh, Imam Omar Suleiman coming up. Um, so I'm now going to, to hand off the mic to Sheikh Mendez, who will share a few minutes, uh, a brief story from the book itself. Um, followed by a talk by Imam Zaid Shakir, 
and Imam Omar Suleiman, and then we'll open it up to some Q&A, inshallah. So we're about to crack the, bo the book open, the book that Sheikh Mendez and Sidi Talut uh, Dawood have been working on that is going to be in your hands soon, inshallah. We're going to get a taste of that book, uh, the book by Imam Suyuti, uh, translated by Sheikh Mendez and uh, Sheikh Talut, Talut uh, Dawood. We're going to get a taste of that right now. Sheikh Mendez, the stage is now yours. Alhamdulillah, wa shukrilah. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Sidi Tariq, Sheikh Ubedullah, Sheikh Aisha, and Imam Dawood Walid, uh, thank you for those profound and inspiring words. Uh, the short time I have, I just want to share one of the vignettes from this incredibly profound work, precious work that Allah has preserved uh, to this day by the great uh, Imam, the great scholar of Hadith, Imam Asiyuti. We're going to talk about a companion that I wonder, before we show the, the title, uh, her name was Barira. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Barira. Barira was one of the close companions of the Prophet and a, and a good friend of our mother, Lady Aisha bint, Abu Bakr, bint Abi Bakr Siddiq. May Allah be pleased with him. Barira, Lady Barira al-Habashiyah, the icon of wisdom and independence. And we're, again, we only have enough time for uh, a few words about her. And inshallah, my hope is that everyone gets the book and they, they spend time. They spend time, inshallah ta'ala, looking at her story and researching her story. There's too much about her to say in this short amount of time. But first, I want to say that this woman, uh, she was formerly enslaved uh, from Ethiopia, according to most of our scholars. And uh, she uh, bought her freedom, inshallah. We'll be talking about that. And uh, she was a former, formerly enslaved woman, black woman, who gave advice to the ruler, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Uh, and so we're going to be learning about Barira, inshallah. Let's begin with these slides. Barira, her name means uh, one who is good, one who is righteous. Bir uh, is, is one who does goodness. And we see that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is reported to have said, لِكُلِّ مُسَمَّ نَسِيبٌ مِنْ اسْمِهِ for everyone who is named, they have a portion of their name. And Barira, she reflected goodness. She reflected righteousness. She reflected piety, uh, as we'll see. And, and that's also uh, demonstrated by her being in the household of the Prophet Wasallam, being in the household of Lady Aisha, our mother. May Allah Ta'ala be pleased with them all. And her, her father, uh, according to Imam al nawawi it, his name was Safwan. So she was Barira, the daughter of Safwan. I don't know her mother's name, uh, sadly, but if any of you, mashallah, can do the research and you find it, please share that with me, mashallah. Next point. Uh, she is distinguished for a number of things. There are a number of ahadith that she narrates, as I mentioned. She actually cautions Abdul Malik ibn Marwan against shedding the blood of Muslims, against shedding the blood of Muslims. And then she narrates a hadith that she heard from him uh, regarding uh, a person, a Muslim being seeing paradise and being prevented from entering paradise because they shed blood. May Allah protect us from that. She's also distinguished by her, the story of her manumission. She was uh, she was owned, quote unquote, so called owned legally by the Banu Hilal, which was a clan, a tribe in Arabia. And there are other narrations that he, she was uh, her master, so called master, was Utbah ibn Abi Lahab, one of the sons of Abu Lahab. Uh, others mention uh, some of the Ansar. Nevertheless, I want to relate to you the story of her manumission, inshallah ta'ala. 
on the authority of our mother Aisha, who said, may Allah Ta'ala be pleased with her. Barira came to me and said, I made a contract with my people. This is called Kitaba, right? And, and Mukataba is a, a contract between a bonds person uh, and a master where they pay for their freedom. They pay for their liberation. And so she made a contract with her people for my freedom in exchange for nine awaq, paid in installments of one uqiya per year. Right, This was a, a kind of a currency uh, that was used in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Assist me. So she comes to her friend, our mother Aisha, and asks for her help. And we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family were always ready to help emancipate and free those who were enslaved. And in our day and age, as Muslims, we should be ready to free those who are enslaved. Did you know that there's approximately 40 million, 40, 40 million modern slaves in the world? We should be on the forefront of that. She, Aisha, said, if your people would like me to pay for it, I will pay it for them, and you will be counted among my freed people, my mawali. So Barira went to her people and told them that. However, they refused. So, she, so the the this goes on. Inshallah, the next slide. So she came from her people while the messenger of God, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was sitting and said, "I made that offer to them, but they refused that I be a freed woman to anyone other than them." Right. So our mother Aisha offered to pay for a manumission on the condition that Barira would be her freed woman. But the Banu Hilal refused this, which was quite strange, quite odd. The person who frees you, you're supposed to be their freed person, right? not that of others. But they wanted to hold on to her. They wanted to control her and keep her. So Aisha informed him. The Prophet Wasallam then said, take it and give them the condition that we previously mentioned. For an individual is considered a freed person of the one that frees and then again, the Prophet Sallallahu went and stood up among the people. He cared. I want you all to focus on the emotion of the story. The Prophet Sallallahu cares so much about Barira. Aisha cares so much about Barira that they're willing to give their money. They're willing to give their time. They're willing to do whatever they can. And now the Prophet Sallallahu is making a public service announcement saying, as to what follows, Amma Ba'd, what is wrong with men? And one narration, Aqwam, what is wrong with the people who place conditions on contracts that are not in the scripture of Allah, that are not in Kitabullah, Azza wa Jal? Any condition that's not in the, the scripture of God is invalid, even if they were to number 100 conditions. The judgment of God is truer and the conditions placed by God are more trustworthy. An individual is only considered a freed person of the one who frees him. And that settled it. Alhamdulillah, she uh, was freed herself, and she was the freed woman of our mother, Aisha, anha. and there are many narrations about their uh, connections with each other. Alhamdulillah. We're going to end with one other hadith about Barira regarding her husband. This is a love story brothers and sisters. It's a story of unrequited, unrequited love, unreturned love. Her husband was Mughith. Mughith was enslaved. He was an enslaved person, a man who was also black. And after her manumission, so this story follows the last, after Barira's freedom, the Prophet wasallam gave her the choice whether or not to stay married to Mughith, who was still enslaved. And this is what happened. Abdullah bin Abbas, God be pleased with him, said, the husband of Barira was a black bondsman who was called Mughith. And I'm using the word bondsman and bondswoman bond, uh, instead of slave because the word slave carries so much negativity with it in uh, the West, especially in North America. And so I'm opting for this word, inshallah ta'ala. He was a bondsman of Bani Fulan. There's also a narration that he was the bondsman of Bani Al-Mughira. 
And the Prophet Sallallahu said, it is as if, Ibn Abbas said, it is as if I'm looking at him while tears are flowing, streaming onto his beard. And the Prophet Sallallahu said to Abbas, Ya Abbas, O oh Abbas, right? SubhanAllah. This is his father, Ibn Abbas's father. Does it not amaze you that Mughith loves Barira so much while Barira hates Mughith? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, why don't you take him back? And look at the, qu the question of Barira. Ya Rasulallah, O oh Messenger of God, are you commanding me? Like, is this a command for me to keep him, stay married to him? Rasulullah Sallallahu said, I am only interceding. And then she responded, I have no need of him. La hajat alifi. I have no need of him. And the Prophet Sallallahu did not pressure her, did not force her. And this shows a number of things. Her willingness to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Number two, the Prophet Sallallahu respect for her choice, her agency, her autonomy. And number two, it shows her independence. This was a woman of great sagacity and great intelligence. And she knew what was right for her. And inshallah, we'll end with that. That's just the taste. This is one vignette of one of these great, great, great uh, companions of the Prophet Sallallahu And in conclusion, I'll, I'll stop with this. This book uh, by Imam Suyuti does not only mention the black companions of the Prophet Sallallahu It mentions black Muslims who lived before him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and as well as black Muslims who lived after him. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I thank all of you. I thank Sheikh Talut Dawood for uh, helping with the translation and so many others. Jazakum Allah khaira. May Allah Ta'ala reward you all. Please share and, and stay tuned. Uh, stay with us for all 10 sessions. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakum Allah khair to, uh, to Sheikh Mendez um, for that really, really beautiful introduction or a small taste of the book, uh, Lady Barira radiallahu anha. Um, what an amazing, amazing um, uh, preview of what's to come. And he's gonna be sharing in some sessions two or three stories like that uh, and have questions and answers and guest speakers who join over the course of the next uh, uh, nine sessions after today's, inshallah. So we're looking forward to that. And he'll be joining us again for the Q&A coming up here shortly. I'm now going to introduce uh, one of my beloved teachers, Imam Zaid Shakir, who will be joining us, uh, inshallah. Imam Zaid Shakir is co-founder and senior faculty member of Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California. He's among one of the most respected and influential Islamic scholars in the West. He obtained a bachelor's with honors in international relations at American University in Washington, D.C., and later earned his master's in political science at Rutgers. For seven years in Syria and briefly in Morocco, he immersed, he immersed himself in an intense study of Arabic, Islamic law, Quranic studies, and spirituality with some of the top scholars of our age. And in 2001, he graduated from Syria's prestigious Abu Nur University with a bachelor's in Islamic sciences. He has recently been appointed as the new chair of MANA, the Muslim Alliance of uh, in North America. And I wanted to actually uh, share that MANA has a current campaign going on, on LaunchGood. Uh, I'm gonna show you on the screen here. We, we wanna urge you all to support that campaign. Um, it's called Recharge MANA, showing you right here on the screen. Um, I think everyone can see that. Yes, this is a launch good campaign going on right now. And uh, we're gonna share the link in the chat. And you can see here the objective is, uh, an or it's an organization of indigenous American Muslims led by Imam Zaid Shaker, dedicated to serving the African American Muslim community and other underserved, primarily inner city Muslim communities. And they, they talk about what the goals of the campaign are, what they're raising funds for, so we, you know, we really uh, love Imam Zaid. We love his work. We love Mana. We want to encourage you all to at least check out this Launch Good page. Um, along with Launch Good, Mana is doing a series of lectures as well this February, this month, um, during Black History Month. Um, so check it out. Click on the link in the comments and uh, check out this Launch Good page 
We hope you help them hit their goal. It looks like they're almost there. They're at 38,000 out of 50,000, mashallah. Imam Zaid, we're honored to have you with us and the stage is now yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidi al-Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam taslima kathira Rabbana laka alhamdu kama yanbaghi li jalali wajhik li azimi sultanik subhanaka la nahsithanan alayka anta kama thnayta ala nafsik Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh It's a great honor to be here this evening with uh, so many of our uh, young, young and younger uh, luminaries. And may Allah Taala preserve all of them and increase them in in knowledge, increase them in righteous deeds, increase them in lawful income. Uh, may Allah Taala bless everyone supporting this initiative uh, undertaken by Sheikh uh, Sheikh Mohammed Mendez and those supporting him to really educate our community about. Uh, Muslims who are either of African or what are referred to as the black Arabs and uh, from that day forward to our day uh, it's a very important chapter in our collective history Alhamdulillah I was asked to speak about the responsibility of the religious leadership imams, scholars and others uh, dua, those who work in calling people to the religion, uh, their responsibility in addressing social ills. So this is a very important aspect of the mission of the, of the Muslims. Uh, and it's, it's, there are many, many inducements and encouragements in the Quran, the Book of Allah, and the Sunnah of His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which really highlight this uh, one uh, phrase from a longer hadith that comes to mind, Wallahu. That Allah will continue to help the servant as long as the servant is assisting his brother or sister, whatever the case might be, but linguistically his brother. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the help of Allah, the assistance of Allah comes to those who are assisting uh, their, their fellow humans and more specifically their fellow believers uh, uh, you're giving uh, divine aid and you're giving given your sustenance based on your treatment of the poor and downtrodden uh, amongst you and so there are many teachings along this line and so the, the leaders have a responsibility to encourage the believers in that regard and to ensure that these teachings remain highlighted uh, uh, for, for the community, that we're a community of, of service, a community of compassion, a community of, of caring, a community of sharing, a community of, of love, a community of mutual support. And then the uh, instructions were to uh, talk about specifically in terms of addressing social ills, uh, the racism that exists in our society and in some uh, ways is manifested in our community itself, the Muslim community. Uh, so uh, it's, it's also responsibility because that's a disease. And so it's a responsibility of those in leadership to draw people's, call people's attention to eradicating that disease. And that context, I think, is, is very uh, important for us to understand, again, what, what advantages do we have as Muslims in terms of addressing uh, this disease? So uh, the Muslim community is, is never going to be Black Lives Matter as a movement. I'm referring to Black Lives Matter as a movement. We're, we're not going to be that. Our, our uh, epistemic foundation is, is different. How we look at reality is different. And, and so I think it's very important for us as Muslims to really decide uh, if we're going to address this issue as strictly 
So definitely, I, I just mentioned a, a couple of narrations that uh, indicate we, we look at it, the, the issue uh, from a, a material perspective. But our advantage lies in approaching the issue of racism as a spiritual disease. And this is something uh, Arnold Toynbee talks about in his essay about Islam and the West and what Islam could offer the West. And one of the things he astutely pointed out was uh, Islam could offer the West a way out of the morass of racism, which he in that essay identifies as a spiritual disease. And so I think as Muslims, if we're going to really address this issue from an Islamic perspective, then we're going to have to address it from the perspective of it being a spiritual disease. And that being the case, ultimately our contribution is to raise people's consciousness above the realm of the physical. Because color is physical. Uh, shaitan, uh, and, and this, as we know, and it's often quoted, uh, shaitan identified his physical superiority. And that Shaitan said, I'm better than him. So that's the supremacy. We talk about racial supremacy. Why? You created me from this physical stuff that has distinct colors. It's white, it's orange, it's red, it's blue, depending on what you're burning. And you created him from this physical stuff called clay that has also physical color. And it was black clay, as most of the, the, the exegetes posit. And so Shaitan, uh, he introduced racism at a physical level. And we have to address it as believers at a spiritual level. And in doing that, we are, are, have a foundation to unify people. Because if we take the physical distinctions to their extreme, we're going to end up exactly or exacerbating the situation this country and increasingly the world finds itself in, where you have the extreme advocates of a, a polarizing white racism against the extreme advocates of a polarizing black racism. And the, the problem will get worse. It will, and the, the approaches will be mutually reinforcing in terms of making the problem worse because there's no physical foundation for unity. It, it involves, as they say, ijtima' ad-daini, two opposites meeting. Like the pen cannot be moving and still at the same time. That's meaning of two opposites. The room can't be uh, light, okay? The room can't be light and dark at the same time. It's either dark or it's light. And the two coexisting involves the meaning of opposites. And so this extreme focus on physical white consciousness and an extreme focus on physical black consciousness doesn't provide a foundation to unify people to transcend the problem. And so once we have gotten in touch with our identity as who we are at a physical level and affirmed and, 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 and uh, our who we are, and this is why this course is very important in that regard, the question is, where do you go from there? And so it's a responsibility of the religious leadership to say to people, now that you know who you are physically, and now that you can begin to understand and transcend those shackles that were holding you in bondage, now it's time to move to your humanity. And addressing the issue as a spiritual problem that will ultimately only be uh, 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 solved 
when everyone moves beyond physical consciousness to spiritual consciousness to put us in touch with our ruh and our nafs that has no color. Now we have a foundation to unify people. And so this program and this approach that Celebrate Mercy is, is giving a platform to is a critical step, but it's a step towards a higher goal. And if, we, if we're stuck at that step, then we will begin to fester in the intense American version of racism that, that makes us, and it's, it's probably the most intense in human history. The South African, even apartheid, you, you had uh, uh, some nuance in how the whole racial situation was approached. It's ugly, it's nasty, it's unacceptable, but American racism is more nasty and more unacceptable. And that's why we have yet to have what they have in South Africa as a step towards solving the problem at a physical level, a level of truth and reconciliation uh, council. We've never come to grips with that in America. There's never been a truth and, rec and reconciliation. And so that's indicative of the depths of this problem. And so once we are affirmed, are affirmed, once we know that there are people who share the lineage, African lineage, people who share black descent, even if they're not Africans, you have black folks in India, you have black folks in Arabia, you have black folks in Palestine, but once, once that awareness and once that consciousness of who we are as a people and how uh, the challenges we face at a structural, institutional, societal level, we have to then move beyond that and look at the issue from a spiritual perspective and then bring people to the awareness of just as they, we're brought to an awareness of who we are as black people or people descended from Africans and people descended from slaves and the common history and the common bonds that that is forged amongst us. Once we have that awareness, now we have to be the people who call people. For, why? Because we've experienced the pain and the hardship and the trauma. And that's a wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he's given our people in this land. Now, once you've experienced in full, you and you know the pain, you don't want anyone else to go through that. And so to prevent people from having to go through that, we have to lead people from all ends of the racial spectrum to their humanity, through their spiritual well-being and through their cultivating their spirit so that they transcend the physical. And is, isn't that the, the, the goal of the spiritual life in Islam? It's, and, and, and it's transcending the chains of physicality, tra transcending the, the histories that are rooted in the physicality, transcending the discrimination the, 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 the glass ceilings that are rooted in the physicality and then moving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being empowered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring the message of Islam to people from a platform and calling them to a, a, a reality that can unify people so that we can smash Racism once and for all. And that's the only way we're going to smash it. That's the only way we're going to smash it. With, Allah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't move towards that level, we're going to exacerbate the problem. Wallahu alam wal musta'an. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumallah khair, Imam Zaid, for that really powerful uh, talk and reminder that we all really need. And, uh, 
the encouragement um, to not just take this class, but also you know think about what we can do with what we learn in this uh, series of, of lessons um, that we've started tonight. Alhamdulillah, Imam Zaid will be joining us um, shortly um, after we hear from our final teacher. Mashallah, I can see some people have posted in the, uh, the comments um, as Imam Zaid was speaking, um, uh, their response and their thoughts on what he was sharing, mashallah. Um, just a reminder that after Imam Omar Suleyman's uh, talk, um, we will have a brief Q&A session um, with our audience. Um, how do you submit questions? You can post them in the comments. If you want it to remain anonymous, you can email them to info at celebratemercy.com. And just a couple of reminders that um, we hope that you can register for this 10-part series. The link to do so um, is celebratemercy.com slash BL. And I also wanted to announce that this Friday, in a couple of days, um, our teacher joining us um, for Friday Gems will be uh, Sheikh Abedullah Evans um, joining us, inshallah. Um, we will be uh, sending you an email and probably a text message as well about the topic and how you can RSVP for this Friday's Friday Gems with uh, Sheikh Abedullah. We'll also have a recitation of Surah Al-Kahf before the virtual uh, lesson on Friday, inshallah. So I'm now going to introduce um, another one of my favorite teachers and activists, uh, Imam Omar Suleyman. Um, and he will be speaking and then we'll go right into the Q&A um, after that, inshallah. Imam Omar Suleyman is the founder and president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research and an adjunct professor, an adjunct professor of Islamic studies in the Graduate Liberal Studies Program at Southern Methodist University. He's also the resident scholar at Valley Ranch Islamic Center and co-chair emeritus of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square. He holds a bachelor's in accounting, a bachelor's in Islamic law, a master's in Islamic finance, a master's in political history, and recently earned a PhD in Islamic thought and civilization from the International Islamic University of Malaysia. So we just also recently had Imam Omar Suleyman just last week on our Friday Gems program. You can find that on our YouTube channel, a beautiful session with him. Uh, Imam Omar Suleyman, it's great to have you with us again, and the stage is now yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasuli al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. It's wonderful to be with you all once again. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan, Tariq, Brother Tariq, and Celebrate Mercy for uh, continuing to do such important work. And to all of the mashayikh and teachers on this call, I'm Zaid, Sheikh Dawood, Sheikh Mandis, Ustaz uh, Aisha. I hope I didn't miss anyone. <laughs> I did join a little bit late. May Allah bless all of you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this work to be beneficial and to be pleasing to him and to be heavy on your scales. Allahumma ameen. I wanted to actually reflect on a particular incident from the life, the lives of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu And before I reflect on that, I wanted to kind of preface um, how I want to reflect on this incident today. So I've spoken about this incident in previous um, settings and it's one that you can approach from many angles and it's one that truly shows the shift in mindsets and the way that in akramakum or in the lahi atqaqum that verily the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became a lived reality and a culture that spiritual transcendence that Imam Zaid was talking about that the Quran calls us to to transcend uh, was a lived reality of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after uh, the tarbiyah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the mentorship of the Messenger, peace and blessings be upon him and what he was able to impart uh, to the companions through his actions first and foremost Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and through the powerful messages that he delivered in regards to this subject and others. And I'll preface it with this. When I look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, and I think of that incident of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looking out at the companions for the very last time as they were in Salah. And Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu describing that incident of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, removing the curtain and looking at the companions in prayer 
for the very last time, alayhi salatu wasalam, and Anas describing the illuminated face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam, describing the happiness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam in those moments, and how proud the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam was of his ummah, right? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam looking at his ummah in salah, that was a sign of the continuity of that prayer, the continuity of the message that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam had left uh, with this blessed Ummah, the Ummah of the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was proud of us, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When we say that with an optimism that we be included amongst his followers, that we be included amongst those that he loved, Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. He was proud to see that Salah had become the imperative of the community and that even though he was leaving, what he imparted of Salah was going to stay. Uh, the incident that I'm going to speak about briefly, and I'm sure is one of the companions that uh, Sheikh Mendes covers, is the incident of Ubadat ibn Samit anhu when he meets Muqawqis uh, of Egypt. And Ubadah ibn Samit was uh, one of the blessed companions of the Prophet وسلم. He accompanied the Prophet وسلم through every one of his battles. He's one of those that was honored with writing the revelation from Kitab al-Wahi. He is the husband of uh, Um Haram bint Minhan radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, who has a blessed story in and of herself and was very dear to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he's one of the very first Ansar of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he is an Ansari man uh, who came to receive the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam very early on to meet him in Mecca, to pledge to him and to uh, receive him in, in al Madinah al Munawwara. He was uh, a very black man, a very tall man, a very beautiful man, a very noble man. Um, he had a, a, a dominant physical presence, but an even more dominant spiritual presence. And this, this incident uh, of his imposing presence, his imposing speech, his imposing strength, his imposing beauty, his imposing character uh, is uh, taking place in the context of the Muslim forces uh, entering into Egypt, which was under Byzantine control at the time. And this was uh, after, you know, at the command of Amr ibn As, ta'ala anhu, under uh, Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu's khilafah. And as these, uh, these, these blessed companions come forth to speak to uh, the, the ruler of uh, the Babylon uh, fortress in Egypt, Al-Muqawqis, Ubada radiallahu ta'ala anhu steps forward. And al muqawqis he uh, he looks at him and uh, in shock he says, "Ibridu anni darik al aswad, move this black one away from me, and, and and put forth someone else who will speak to me, and uh, and 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 will not um, upset me, will not frighten me, and you know you know that." You know that things have changed when Ubadah radiallahu anhu doesn't have to answer for himself. You see, if Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu anhu had to answer him and say to him, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, is the one with the greatest piety. If Ubadah ibn Samit radiallahu ta'ala anhu had to justify his own presence, then that would have meant that he was fighting this battle alone, that he had to represent the prophetic shift, not just first and foremost in Tawheed, but all the implications uh, of Tawheed, all the implications of monotheism now in uh, equalizing the creation of Allah, the human uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only pre preferring one to the other by virtue of taqwa. But Ubadat ibn Samit anhu didn't have to reply. The companions responded on his behalf and says, "Inna hada afdaluna ra'ya, ra'yan wa ilma." That this this one is the best of us in his intellect and in his in his wisdom and his knowledge. He is the best of us. He's the one that's most deserving, and he is our leader. And he has been appointed over us. And when we have anything amongst us in terms of shura or difference, we refer back to him. And we have given him our pledge and we will never go against him. And they also said, And verily, black and white to us are equal. Meaning you people still live in ignorance, but to us, they are equal. 
and no one is given preference except by their taqwa, except by their piety. And Muqawqis is is shocked by the response of the companions. And he says, how do you accept this black man to be the leader of you? Rather, he should be the least of you. And they respond once again in defiance, uh, saying that in Islam, we do not have these false, um, you know, these false hierarchies that do not exist uh, and that ha- that are that are man-made out of jahri, out of ignorance. He's the best of status amongst us. He is the most noble of us. He is the most wise of us. And we do not frown upon what you frown upon. You know, we, meaning we don't frown on the color of his skin the way that you frown upon the color of his skin. So Al-Muqawqis finally basically resigns himself to having to speak to Arbadat ibn Samit. And he tells him, you know, come forward and speak to me, O black man. But he says, you know, be gentle because uh, your, your blackness scares me. And if you speak harshly to me, then it's going to scare me even further. And Ubadat ibn Samit, and this is perhaps part of the imposing speech and wisdom that he has, Ubadat ibn Samit, he, he basically, um, you know, ex- exposes the man's vulnerability and Muqawqis' vulnerability. He said, I have heard what, you know, I've heard what you've said. And he says, listen, if you're afraid of me, he says, uh, that I have left behind me, that, that behind this delegation are a thousand people, a thousand men, and they're all just as black as me. And even ashaddu sawad than minni, and they're even blacker than me. And they're going to scare you even further. So if you're scared of me because you don't like black people, wait till you see the, the thousand black men that are behind me, and they will scare you. Um, even more. And he goes on to give this really eloquent, um, long speech, which I can't cover now. But at the end of it, uh, subhanAllah al-Muqawqis, he says, Hal mithra kalam, kalami qat? Have you ever heard the words of one like this one? And he says that I was afraid of his appearance, but what he has said scares me even more than his appearance, um, which is just powerful, right? The the, imp- the imposing words of Urbat ibn Samit. All of this to say, by the way, and, and the point that I want to make here, imagine how proud the Prophet Sallallahu would have been of that moment, right? Where it's not just the Prophet Sallallahu setting a standard and reminding the companions over and over again that these types of hierarchies are from jahli, are ignorance. It's not just the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appointing Bilal Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu to stand on the Kaaba and to give the Adhan even if some people made some of the comments that they made and uh, they, they preferred other than Bilal Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu for various reasons. But it has gone from what is acceptable and unacceptable to what is expected, the new standard amongst the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we get to a point where the standard has been set where those that are oppressed and discriminated against don't have to defend themselves because a community of believers all come to the aid of the one that is oppressed and the one that is discriminated against and the one that is wrong. When there's a full embrace of our deen, our history and everything that comes with it, then we have truly elevated ourselves to a place that we're more worthy of making the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam proud and we pray that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allow us to be amongst those that he is proud of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the Day of Judgment. Allahumma ameen wa jazakumullahu khayran. Thank you so much uh, Imam Omar Suleiman and uh, inshallah he will be uh, joining us shortly um, for the Q&A. Um, it's always an honor to have Imam Omar and that was a really beautiful story and a reminder um, for us, that's that's especially relevant to this series, but also to our community now. Jazakumullah um, khair, Imam Omar. Just a reminder to everyone, I mentioned that we have a course that is going on right now, another course that you can sign up for, which is the Portrait of a Prophet class. Uh, and I see, mashallah, um, Sara sharing some of the comments of Imam Omar's uh, talk. This class, uh, is go, goes on every Monday and Thursday. Those who register for it um, get access to the videos for a period of uh, uh, six months. It's 40 hours of content all about the Shama'il of the Prophet Muhammad um, which is his personality, his beauty, his characteristics. Some of the, it's 415 hadiths uh, from the Shama'il of Imam Tirmidhi 
on how the Prophet Sallallahu looked, his appearance, his, how he walked, how he talked, his, how, he, how, his, uh, how he was at home, what did he have in his home, his smile, his laughter, uh, his sense of humor, his humility, how he recited the Quran, how he worshiped. There's so many hadith, and this class is ongoing. It started um, the beginning, actually December 31st, and it's going all the way till early April. Um, and you, if you missed some of the class already, you can go back and watch the recordings. And if you can't afford the class, we have scholarships available as well. So don't let financial uh, difficulties cause you to not register. We have scholarships available, uh, inshallah. And I mentioned LaunchGood is one of our publicity partners for today's program, and they have a really great program with MANA going on throughout the month of February. Um, please make sure to check out MANA or LaunchGood's social media to see what they have coming up in terms of webinars for Black History Month. And lastly, before we get into the Q&A, um, during the course of these 10, uh, 10 part series, we're going to be featuring, um, mashallah, some of our black brothers and sisters who are artists and performers and, um, and mashallah, to celebrate the arts among the African-American Muslim community. Um, and one of those sisters is Sister Sarai Ruth. Uh, she's a great poet. Check out her YouTube channel, uh, Taqwa Tales, and she has a brief poem she's gonna share and then we'll get started with the Q&A. Sister Sarai, um, the stage is now yours. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, before I get into it, this uh, poem that I'm going to share is for children. So if you have any um, little ones nearby, please invite them to be a part, inshallah. Uh, the piece that I'm going to share is uh, titled Brother White and Brother Black. Um, and it was written to um, address issues of race um, and to talk about the merits of piety. Um, so I'll get started. Inshallah, your little ones are nearby. Bismillah. Brother White and Brother Black bickered on for many moons, trying to gather who was best by looking at their hues. Brother White said, it is I, with skin like natural silk. Surely the Lord does love the one whose skin he made like milk. Brother Black said, it is I, a precious earthly sight. Surely the Lord does love the one whose skin he made like night. And so it went on and on in evenings without rest, arguing about whose color made them of the best. And finally, after days when neither won the fight, they visited a learned man to weigh in on their plight. Oh, learned one, said Brother Black. Does not the Lord of all love me more when he made me dark like the higher skies, the fig, the date, the fertile soil, dark like mighty boulders from which water springs forth, dark like mighty iron forged for duty and for work? Surely these things he mentions with great reverence in his speech, proving through creation that his love is more for me. But learn it one, said Brother White. Look at me and think of a pale moon and stars, of Jannah's blessed drink, of a place beyond the world where rivers look like me, of the clouds like gentle mountains and of daybreak's majesty. Surely all of these things point me to my station that I and no other are more beloved among the Lord's creation. The learned one listened patiently and lifted his head to start. It is not about light or dark, my friends, but what is in the heart? Are you racing for his pleasure? Do you obey his command? Do you follow his beloved and the guidance of Quran? Do you pray? Do you dhikr? Seeking each day your spirits fill, do you call upon Allah when in chaos and when the world is still? Are you kind? Are you giving? Do you do your best of deeds when you see the one downtrodden? Do you try to meet his needs? Do you stand for love and justice? Do you stand for hope and peace? Do you stand for those who cannot stand and those who cannot speak? You see, the heart most beloved to him is the one that is drawn near. There is no station that comes from what you find by looking in a mirror. So if you compete for God's love, look not at your skin, but the iman inside your heart and how it shows upon your limbs. 
And with that, the men dispersed to go and find their spirits filled, to purify their hearts and cleanse them of every ill through prayer and remembrance, through service and good deeds, through walking gently on the earth and planting fruitful seeds. They sought their Lord in truth with love inside their breast, striving with everything they had to be the one that he loved best. And over this love they sought, sometimes you'd find them in a spat and the learned one would smile and say, much better this than that. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. Assalamu alaikum. Mashallah. Mashallah, Sister Sarai. I could see uh, Imam Zaid smiling, uh, really enjoying that. Yeah, mashallah. And um, that was amazing. That was amazing. Mashallah. And we want to encourage you all to follow her YouTube channel, Taqwa Tales. She's an amazing poet. Hopefully we can have her back during this series. Inshallah, I could see uh, the responses in the comments, mashallah, um, from our audience. Really, really beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Mashallah. Um, Jazakum Allah khair. Um, so now let's open up for questions, and we're going to bring um, some of the speakers who have been with us tonight back to the stage, the virtual stage, and um, we can start with one question now. Um, this question was, we want, we want everyone to chime in as well. We're probably only going to have time for like two or three questions overall because we're running a bit over time, but let me start with this question. The question is directed to uh, Imam Amr Suleiman, but I hope everyone can chime in here and say, the question is, can you give us two, a couple of practical tips, uh, what I can do in my own community to help uh, eradicate this disease of racism? Because it's so, it's so, it's it's very common, especially here in the United States, even among the Muslim community, it's something that's a very widespread. So, what can I do practically? Um, uh, as an individual in my community, maybe not a leader of my community, to help uh, eradicate this. And I'd love for all the other teachers to chime in as well, inshallah. I'm going to be super quick. I, I see the best dressed imam of uh, Sheikh Abedullah Evans. I didn't say that. Man, mashallah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Uh, what an honor to be with you all. So my answer is really I'm, st I'm still thinking about that poem, man. It was tremendous, Allah man. Allah mm -hmm. was beautiful. And, and, and de delivered with, you know, requisite passion and, and, and talent, man. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you. I have the, the quickest answer, support Nana. That's all I got to say. So practical Allah. tip is support Nana. And then I'll, I'll, Allah I'll Allah. hand it off, uh, inshallah ta'ala, to those that Allah are just starting to speak. Alhamdulillah. Imam <laughs> <laughs> Um just very very briefly, um we uh in Imam Zaid Hafidullah Ta'ala was talking about the spiritual dimensions or we could say the metaphysical dimension behind racism and the primary disease, uh spiritual disease, according to Sheikh Ahmadu Bamba that informs racism is arrogance, kibr. So one of those uh, suggestions from a community standpoint is for people in the community to go into another community and do khidmah or service for those individuals, but the khidmah can't be a type of patronizing or paternalistic type of khidmah, right? It's the type of khidmah that you're going there to serve the people for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal, and actually you are doing more benefit for your soul than the actual the khidmah that you're doing for the people, right? So we're stuck in our silos, suburban, urban. Um, we, we, we stick in our own social circles. Obviously we have COVID-19 um, restrictions, but when we pray to Allah to lift this waba from us, but Inshallah, when this is lifted, we're able to give um, real uh, khidmah and take that that jihad, that struggle uh, to to step outside of our comfort zones and actually travel into different uh, communities. Imam hey, can you can you add to that? Jazakumullah khair. Um, uh, I was seeing Sheikh Ubaidullah in deep thoughts, so I think he should add. <laughs> 
he's, he's, uh, he's uh, reflecting at a very I just, deep level. I just, I just I, you know, this is this is uh, so delightful for me, man. Just to spend time with you, you know what I'm saying, and just to be able to look at you, mashallah. And um, but no, mashallah. The, the, the question is a, a profound one, and I think that sometimes over analysis can lead to paralysis. You know, I find mm. that we have to get beyond some of this. Um, you know, uh, excessive planning. I think the important thing is lead to arafu. We have to we have to get to know one another. Sometimes that is agenda enough, just to enter each other's spaces and to move beyond these barriers that have separated us in terms of geographic loca location, social economic status, um, and just to be in the same space to know of our common humanity, man. You know, I, I think that um, a lot of these racist attitudes, to my mind, they come from two sources. One is insecurity, that a person is insecure about the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that they believe that someone's promotion is their demotion, right? That in esteeming someone else that they're losing something and recognizing the beauty or the brilliance or the ingenuity of someone else, they're losing something. And the other thing is ignorance, but jahl basid, yani, simple ignorance, that we have degraded real encounter. You don't spend any time with black communities, or you don't spend any time with white communities, or you don't spend any time with Arab communities, or you don't spend any time with South Asian communities. And so what you fill in that, that missing actual experience with is stereotypes, lies, sensational tales, uh, 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 you know, and, and so lita awful, spending enough time so that we get to see that, subhanAllah, you know, there are, you know, things that make us different, but that which we have in common is certainly greater, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah alayhi sallallahu alayhi wasallam, than those things which, those things which separate us, man. So I think, you know, making an earnest and intentional effort to share space with one another, just to eat, to, to allow the children to play together, to watch them grow up, to talk about life. And I think very powerful coalitions uh, and, 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 and synergistic relationships grow out of that kind of fellowshipping. And Allah knows best. Yeah, yeah I'd like to add just briefly that uh, in, in the Shafi school, and the, really one of the people who was most uh, strong in this opinion is that as, as long as you can make, I mean, practice your religion in a non mode it's forbidden for you to leave, to migrate, even to a Muslim land. Because he says that the space you occupy in that non-Muslim realm, that is Darul Islam. And if you leave, you leave a void that can only be filled by, by kufr. Mm. And, and so in any case, I say that to preface that uh, a lot of times we, we focus on what we can do for others as an affirmation of our, in this context, our anti-racism. So if I can go to this community and do some service or help or teach something, then that's how I affirm my anti-racism. But I think it's a lot of times we have to look at what we can do for ourselves to look inward and and to make sure that that void, like to, to go back to the, the original uh, bit of information about the, the Shafi opinion on staying in Darul Kufr, if, if you make sure that space you occupy is a space of anti-racism. And so not necessarily going out to, that's an important part of it, not to negate that, but to make sure that you yourself are looking at yourself and you're looking at what you can do to transcend that insecurity that was referenced, that sometimes pushes us to these outward displays of quote unquote anti-racism. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
But if we solve the problem within, then everyone we deal with. So it's not just a conscious effort to be part of an event. So I'm going to the protest, go to the protest by all means, if it's safe and nonviolent and there's something positive, but it becomes, I am a living embodiment of what I proclaim. Therefore, my affirmation doesn't lie in an event. It doesn't lie uh, in a particular initiative, but it touches every single individual I come in contact with, regardless of the space I'm in, especially yeah. in that home space. Because a lot of times we can fall into doing something externally, but when we're in our own space that reinforces those prejudices, we fall right back into the, the negativity that we're trying to escape. To just to, to try to make that real is like the guy he 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 goes home he at work he's the nicest guy to all the women on the job. If the secretary spills coffee on him, it's like my lish, don't worry about it. You know, we all have that. Then he goes home and screams at his wife. A lot, a lot. And so we we want to be the person that has that moral, that spiritual integrity and consistency. So everyone we come into contact with, every situation that we're in radiates that spirit of anti-racism. And, and our anti-racism isn't just confined to an event. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm not saying don't do everything uh, that was mentioned in terms of visiting, getting involved. That's very powerful. But let the foundation for that be something deeper and something of, of, of greater integrity so that it transcends everything that, or it, excuse me, alhamdulillah. It informs and permeates everything that we do and every situation we're in. Jazakumullah khair, Imam Zaid. So um, another question is, and, and this is post Imam Zaid, but I hope everyone can contribute uh, to this one, is um, someone was saying that I agree that, you know, racism is a uh, spiritual disease, but how do you um, how do you speak to people who are not spiritual uh, from that standpoint? Like, how do you convince someone who's not spiritual or maybe religious that the, the, the root cause of racism is 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 spiritual it's a spiritual malady um how do you and, and and maybe i can add on to that like for those who are participating in like black lives matter uh protests you know what should I, how should we be operating during that engagement you know if, if we're coming to it from a spiritual perspective how do we interact with those who don't come to it from that perspective teach them is Mm-hmm because then then they'll be, if we teach people truly Islam, I think that's our re responsibility, then they'll be in a position to understand that perspective. And while we're teaching, uh, we, we support others. So I'm not saying don't go to a Black Lives Matter protest if you see some good in it. And if you see you have an, especially if you have an opportunity in that, that context to help people see that as a Muslim, you are standing with the poor, the downtrodden, the oppressed. Uh, but ultimately, th those are intermediary steps. Ultimately, we have to teach people the religion. And that, that starts, of course, very incrementally. And while we're doing that, to, to try to represent the values uh, that, that we uh, advocate. So is there, there are multi levels of engagement, but I think one, one mistake we're making, the two mistakes we're making, this is just my personal opinion that's uh, amenable to, to being corrected or critiqued. Uh, one mistake is I think we've abandoned uh, a position of leadership in the sense like, why can't we organize our own protests that from beginning to end reflect the values of our religion while focusing the attention of our community on a particular social issue. 
and and then secondly, I, I think we have to begin to, and it goes back to the first, just abandoning our position of leadership. If you're really, really concerned about uh, Black Lives Matter protests, then make sure the intensity that those protests manifest in election years, like 2016 and 2020, continues between elections. And you be the one pushing because uh, uh, I, if, if we just focus on elections, which are increasingly polarizing, because it's a zero sum game, we don't have a parliamentary electoral system where say like this now, it's, it's the presidential election, the, the winning party gets 48% of the seats in Congress and the, the, the winners get 48, the losers get 46, and then some third parties get the balance. It's winner take all. And so you have, not, and right now you have 70 some odd million frustrated Trump supporters. Just as in 2016, you had 60 some odd million frustrated Hillary Clinton supporters. And, and so the, these polar extremes, they're not sustainable. This system, uh, what, what happened January 6th is just a harbinger of what's coming. The, the system of winner take all. And there's no way for the, for the loser to express themselves uh, when they're out of power through the political system. It, it's not sustainable. And, and so what can you do to help uh, sustain efforts, at ex extra systemic efforts at systemic change that are divorced from the electoral cycle. Otherwise the, the electoral cycle and the, the nature of our actions and how they're used only enforce, reinforce the divisions. So those, those, those people, anyway, I'm, I'm deviating. Make sure that you are doing things extra systemically that are divorced from the electoral cycle to affect change. Otherwise, the, the powerful actors within the two-party system will manipulate what you do to advance their agenda with full consideration of what your agenda might be. Jazakallah khair. This will probably be the final question, so I'd like to ask the others to add on to that. You know, how do we frame our interaction with those who are not religious, not Muslim, in our activism, given that we view racism essentially or at its root as a spiritual disease? How do we interact with people who don't come from that framework? Um, maybe, maybe, Madawood, could you go next on that? Okay. Okay. Can I well, can I quickly? I want to share something what my my teacher said. And because this will, uh, it is it, the best thing one could do. He said, uh, Yani, he frequently would say, Yani, Rajulun Wahidun Sahibul Hal, you ethir ala elf your Rajul. Wa elf your Rajul in Bila Halin, la you ethirun ala Wahid. That one person with a, a refined spiritual state can affect a thousand people. A thousand yeah. people collectively with no state can of, cannot. Yeah affect a single person. So just working on yourself and then going out there, your your the this tongue of your state has an effect on people and helps move people and societies in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that, Imam Dao. No problem, Sheikh. No. Um in regards to the question, I think that an issue that we have as Muslims before we're trying to convince people who aren't Muslims of this framework, uh, I think we as Muslims need to get straight on our own framework. I, I think that actually comes first. And innocently, I think that many of us have adopted the nomenclature and, and the epistemology of others who don't have an Islamic framework to the point that we have not done to Dabr and contemplated the Quran even as we use the terms that we deploy, if you understand what I'm saying. So one of the geniuses of the nation of Islam, though we disagree with their aqidah, 
is that they had a truly independent framework and even came up with their own nomenclature and then propagated that to the broader society. Like, like they came up with words like trichnology, for instance. Like that wasn't a, a, a term that they kept with trichnology, right? <laughs> Just using that as an example, we have a hadith that says, li kulli shayin haqiqa, right? For every truth, there is a deeper reality. So we as Muslims, we believe that behind all physical manifestations are metaphysical realities, right? So are we viewing things from this framework? I'll give an example. Um, there's, a de there's a different definition for racism in Webster's Dictionary than what one would read from critical race theory. Critical race theory would say that racism is only confined to prejudice plus power. Now, if we just did to double on the Quran and we look at this hadith, li kulli shayin haqiqa, we couldn't reduce racism to just prejudice plus power. If we say Iblis is the original racist, Iblis never had positional power over Abu Bashir Adam alayhi salam. And for that matter, Shaitan is not a Sultan over us. And this is what the Quran clearly says this, right? And even for those who have president, uh, positional power, they may be able to afflict more physical harm, but that doesn't mean that harm cannot come from the one who doesn't have positional power. You understand what I'm saying? So, um, and, 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 and these are things that we readily can't see. And we, as a, so I, I would just uh, offer this challenge and we could go into it more, but I offer this challenge to us who are in activism spaces, and especially talking about racial justice, we really need to interrogate the nomenclature and the definitions that other people gave us. Um, and maybe we shouldn't accept the definitions and framework that other people gave us as like objective truth. Uh, the Quran is our objective truth. Uh, the Asutu the, Nabawiya is authentic, is objective truth, right? And we start from that point and then those things that jive with it, we use it. Those things that that don't, then we flesh those out and we kind of push those to the side. And then once we get our own framework straight as a community, then we can better uh, articulate and embody uh, what our uh, beloved Sheikh uh, Imam Zaid, uh, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, uh, just articulated. Allah knows best. Um, Imam Omar, can you add to that, please? I don't want to pollute anything um mashallah I, I, i'm going to be um reflecting on what imam zaid mentioned about um yani rajulun wahid bihal yu'athiru ala alf wa alf wa alf rajulun bi ghayri hal imam zaid i'm asking you to send it to me that yu'athiru ala wahid basically did i get it right rajulun wahidun sahibu al hal yu'athiru ala wahid wa alf rajulun bila hal there are so many times I've witnessed that the one person that changes the atmosphere of thousands um, and subhanallah um, I was just thinking about you know even in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, on the day of judgment where the Prophet said a person comes with a great posture right huge big mighty and he doesn't weigh uh, the wing of a mosquito in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, mm. that's a powerful uh, mm. statement that Imam Zay just gave us. And I would say that it just takes yeah. me back to, you know, when, when you look back at our history and you look back at Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu telling Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Um, and and I, I think this is a really powerful conversation. Abu Ubaidah al-Jarrah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, they're both from al-Ashr al-Mubashira. They're both from the 10 promised paradise. I mean, they are, you don't get more noble than, than two of the 10. So between them, they make up one fifth of those that were promised paradise in that in that long hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu went out and told Umar al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, he commented on his on his dress and how he would be coming in, the appearance of Umar radiallahu anhu entering into al-Quds. Abu Ubaidah was not a man of vanity. Uh, he was a man that Umar anhu visited in his home and saw his lack of possessions and cried over his uh, over his lack of possessions. And um, subhanAllah, you know, 
he was saying that because he he wanted you know the best appearance for the Muslims, the best in position of the Muslims in that in that in that space. And uh, Umar radiAllahu ta'ala anhu responds and, and says, "I wish it wasn't you that said it to me, oh, Abu Ubaidah. I wish it was someone else." And he says um, that نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ عَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ إِنَّ فَذَيْنَ الْعِزَّةِ لِغَيْرِهِ إِذَا لَهُ اللَّهُ that we are people that Allah gave honor to through Islam, and if we seek it through other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. Um, I, I, I just want to sort of re-emphasize, you know, make sure that you never stop speaking from your foundations, from your framework, from your perspective, even if you're in a space that does not adopt it at all. Um, that doesn't mean you have to adopt the space um, because you have internalized the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all need to do a better job of that. Um, mm-hmm. well, not, not not everyone here, Michelle. <laughs> we all, as a, as a community, um, really need to pause and reflect. Uh, you know, and, and I've noticed that just, you know, uh, the the idea of, of just starting off, uh, you know, the the remarks that you give at a place with "Assalamu alaikum" or "Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim." Uh, I'm not going to erase that. That's that's how I'm going to start. That's who I am. Uh, and then, of course, at a deeper level, the foundations, the, the epistemology, uh, where we act from. So, yes, we have to be more intentional about our frameworks, about them being authentic and effective um, frameworks from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet and, and pause. And, um, and, I'll, and I'll end with one thing. You know, if the, the, I've said this many times. Um, and maybe I need to listen to it more myself. And I know it's COVID, and we're all we're living in an isolated world. Um, but ibuni fudlafa, the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Find me amongst the downtrodden. Like if you're looking for me, you you can bet that you're going to find the Prophet Sallallahu amongst the downtrodden. You're going to find him at Armada when Masakin when Madrumin. You're going to find him with the widows and the orphans and the downtrodden, the marginalized, the poor." That's who you're going to find the Prophet I'm sitting with, the Ahl Sufas of the world, uh, the people that are uh, not being looked at, the Prophet is looking at them. The, the people that are not being looked after, the Prophet is looking after them. Uh, the Prophet did not show up for the symbolic protest. He he lived a life amongst the downtrodden, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's where you would find him uh, in his normal day-to-day and when we are engaged in uh, prophetic khidmah uh, service, your word carries more weight. Like, like I think people really underestimate that. You know, uh, Imam Zaid, when, when, when Imam Zaid said, uh, we, we can't forsake our position as leaders, I know Imam Zaid did not uh, intend by that. I know, uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope no one understood from that. I know that's not what he intended at all, that forsake your, your spokesperson role. No, like forsake... The leader is a servant of the people. That's what, that's what I understood from what. Of course, Imam Zaid, you're here, and, and uh, you know, like, like I, I, I know that, that's what I understood from you. Is being a leader means being a servant of the people, and so being a leader is not just being out front. Being a leader is is serving in the back when when others are, are neglectful of their duties, and um, inshallah ta'ala, I hope we can do that more effectively. And when we do that. Just like the Prophet ﷺ, when he stood up on Safa, his word carried weight uh, because, of, because of who he was. His word carried weight. So our word will only carry weight when our service is consistent, sincere, and prophetic. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us what's best uh, and to guide through us to what's best and to, to use us uh, for, uh, for that good. No, we, no, we we definitely have to serve, and I think when we talk about spiritual qualities, one of the greatest is love. We we have to love each other. The, the Prophet Sallallahu he loved his ummah. He he loved the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so when we speak on these matters, no one should get the impression. I think is a good clarification that Sheikh Omar mentioned that. When we're not servants, the Sayyidu Qawm Qadimuhum or Qadim al Qawm Sayyiduhum. And but we love everyone, every no matter what you're doing, you know, we're all we're all on the same team. 
You know, you, you might be a social justice warrior. You might be a, a person who's in your house making a khatam of Quran every month during your awrad of kar. You never participate in any demonstration or anything. But we're, we're all on the same team at the end of the day. That's the team of La Alhamdulillah Muhammad Rasulullah. And I, I, I have love for all of my brothers and sisters. I'm sure everyone who spoke tonight would say the same thing. You know, we might differ on some things, the particulars, but the, the universals that unite us are far greater than the particulars that are used by shaitan to divide us. And so mm -hmm. if we can mm -hmm. get that space, you know, we're in good shape, inshallah. We have a bright future as a community. Yeah. They just mentioned Al Mutafaq Alayhi Akthar min Al Mukhtaraf. Al Mukhtaraf. What we agree upon is so much greater than what we differ upon. And, uh, you know, what we we have the rope of Allah. And uh, I'll just end by saying I love all of you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I, I, I love you too. I feel, I feel, I feel relief too. in my heart just looking at you all. Allah. Obeyed Allah, you deep in thought again, man. Yes. <laughs> Sheikh Abedullah, you have the, the final word here. I'll, I'll make it, I'll make it, inshallah, appropriately short, inshallah. You know, this, this issue, and I think, you know, the questioner asked um, a very good question. I've explored this uh, in many different spaces. And what I've, what I've arrived at, uh, and Allah knows best, is that if we talk about usul, if we talk about like the root causes, if we talk about like the basis of something like racism in spiritual illness, then we, we, we humanize racism, you see? Because all of the spiritual illnesses that a racist might be afflicted with, I can certainly be afflicted with. You see, it forces me to be introspective. I have to say, you know, if it's about justice, where am I being unjust? If it's about love, where am I failing to show love? If it's a, it, and I think that, you know, I was in one space and I was attempting to look at, you know, the spiritual root causes of racism. And a friend of mine said to me, Obey the law, we don't need to humanize racism, right? We don't need to humanize racism. And I said, No, I think that's exactly what we need to do. Because if we humanize this issue, then it becomes something that we confront collectively. But I think there is something about our context that incentivizes us to demonize instead of humanize, right? Um, and I think you know social media has a lot to do with that. I think the echo chambers in which we speak, you know, have a lot to do with that. But when we talk about these things, the spiritual illnesses, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, is relevant to all of us. And you can't say it's the 99, you can't say it's the 1%, or it's these people, it's, it's all of us. Now, those who are um, guilty of, you know, the kind of injustice that has greater ramifications because of where they're positioned, Perhaps we can we, we can we can differentiate, but the spiritual root causes are all the same. Mm -hmm. Right? They're all the same. So if I'm talking about racism as a as a spiritual illness, then it forces me to look at myself. And I think that we have uh, you know a society of people that, in our obsession with outward justice, we're obscuring right something about our reality. Is obscured, and I think that um, you know sometimes, and I'm not, I'm not in any way, kind of wholesale charging anybody with being insincere, but sometimes a focus on everything going on out there is a very easy, convenient, and comforting way to ignore everything going on in here. You understand what I'm saying? And I think that uh, when you talk about those spiritual root causes. I mean, that's, that's where you go, you know, that's where you go. Uh, and, and may Allah help us to be people that embody, you know, the message that we bring. And that if I'm encouraging somebody to be introspective about privilege or about injustice, 
I've done said introspection. I mean, real quick example, Tonic, and I'll close with this, man. This is much easier said than done. You know, when I when I lived in Egypt and I was working, it was the first time that I experienced unearned American privilege, right? I was being paid more for the same job that Egyptians were doing. And I said to myself, man, I see why white folks like this, man. This is how it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to, you know, it's it, 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 it's 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 difficult to actually request an audience with with your employer and say, you know, I don't think this is right that I'm being paid more just because I'm an American. See, that's that's difficult. But if I if I if I can find myself to talking about the privilege that other people enjoy, that I don't have to be a person of pissed. I don't have to be a person of other. You see. Uh, but when you talk about those spiritual root causes, you, you know, you're forced to go there. And Allah knows best. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Tariq, do you have, I mean, are, are they going to kick you off the platform or something? I just want to. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead, Imam Zay. No. Conversation. I mean, because, again, if, if we look at it as a spiritual problem and a, a problem of the corruption of our, our souls, Imam Ghazali mentions there's four ways to identify it. I think so what uh, Sheikh uh, Ubaidullah was talking about was identifying those defects within yourself. So he, he said there's four way. One is the guidance of, of a Sheikh who's trained in these matters and recognizing the diseases of the soul and guiding you past them. The second, he said, was a sincere friend. So Siddiq al who who you encourage because you know their piety, their honesty, their sincerity. If you see anything in me that's wrong, then let me know about it so I can correct it. All right. And the third he said was your enemies. Listen to the criticism of your enemies. Mm. Because they're not gonna try to flatter you. Mm. So your friend might flatter you, and so you don't want to hear that. You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Oh, me? Yeah, I am. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be humble like that, but I like hearing that. <laughs> and then the fourth he said was mixing up with the people. Mm. The long mass. Because he said, as you mix up with the people and you see the defects they have, he said, you can be assured that you probably have the same thing that mm. you see in them because human nature doesn't differ so much that there's such a broad range that what you see consistently in the people isn't manifested in you. And so when we see those things, that the racism, it behooves us to step back and say, you know what, at some level, am I also manifesting that? So, yeah, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to just have a conversation. Uh, sometimes you get a, the talking heads, but it's good to like just listen, respond, interact. Uh, if we could have some virtual tea, we could go on all night. Aloha. Another coffee. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, right. you know, COVID has allowed some of these gatherings to happen, you know, but uh, where we can have these conversations. So we're really grateful to all of you, you know, who joined us. And uh, Imam Zaid, uh, I always like to feature like, you know, what the children are saying. And uh, we got a, an Instagram story here. You can see it right here where they're asking, my son Musa is checking his bookshelf and asking, does he have anything fiction? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Let me grab some fiction right quick. <laughs> Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Yeah, there's, there's some fiction. Does Imam Zaid read fiction? Yeah, yeah. I try to I try to do some fiction. Yeah. Let me let me find some quick fiction. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Yeah, keep keep going, wrapping up. Keep the wrap up point. I know I have some fiction. Jazakumullah khair. Well, we wanted to um, you know, maybe Sara, you can share some of the comments from the, the audience, you know, Jazakallah khair to, to Sara Bilal, Sabria, Samar Malik, our entire team behind the scenes who've really been helping uh Hasna, you know, our entire Subhan. We have a we have a whole team working behind the scenes. They're they're not 
they're not here in the spotlight, but they're without them, this couldn't be possible, mashallah. So Jazakumullah there, thank you. And <laughs> Sheikh Abela, someone's also asking, how many shoes do you have? <laughs> oh, this, 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 is, this is actually just, my, my, my library is, is another part of the house. This is just my closet, man. City <laughs> <laughs> Nail from New York. Allah, Allah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> here I am, here I'm in, 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 in the masjid, you know. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say that to you, Shaykh. Don't worry. <laughs> you know, I love you. I love you too. I'll see all of you soon, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. 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 Were you able to find something, Imam Zaid? No, I think that's in another room. That's in, the, that's, that's in the fiction session. Do I get to section. promote a book, by the way? <laughs> what was that, Imam Omar? I wanted to promote. This is actually a book that I was just looking through right now. Oh, mashallah. And this is a beautiful book by uh, Mufti Farhan Zuberi uh, called In the Company of Scholars. Yeah. And subhanAllah, I was, just, I was just looking at it as we um, as we were, were, were starting this and have the blessed opportunity. So you can get this book from uh, the IOK Institute of Knowledge mm -hmm. Press. It's such a beautiful book uh, by a beloved uh, scholar and friend. So even in the Zoom company of scholars, is just yeah. is just a barakah, mashallah. I can see the barakah coming through, alhamdulillah. Yeah, and to address that question, I also wanted to just give okay. a plug to Imam Dawood's book. Imam Dawood's book on towards sacred activism. It's an amazing book on this topic. We actually carry this in our Celebrate Mercy online store too. So... The question that was asked about how we engage in our activism from our framework as Muslims, a lot of that is addressed in this beautiful book. So I really want to give a shout out to Imam Dawood for, for, uh, for this, this amazing book too, alhamdulillah. Okay. Shaykh, I usually carry that fiction, book in my laptop fiction, bag. Fiction alert. And it's a classic. Charles Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> a tale of two cities. MashaAllah. With the, the, the famous uh, beginning, right? So we have to read it. Because it's appropriate for our times, right? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the, it was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of, the, some of its noisiest authorities insisted on it being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. And that's a single sentence. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You said that was just one sentence. One sentence. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. And amongst these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That's one sentence. This is nonfiction right here. Everyone should get a copy. Okay. This is written by uh, Sister Amira, the uh, wife of uh, Brother Idris, uh, and uh, who passed away. Many of you knew Brother Idris, and so this is helping her. And also a beautiful book that helps to cultivate ecological consciousness, green Muslims uh, amongst our younger generation. So... Sam the Junior Herbalist, nonfiction, or fiction rather. Make sure you get a copy. Allahu Akbar. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who joined. Uh, may Allah bless you and your families. Uh, and we went, we went way over time, but I think this discussion was really legendary. Um, it'll be, I hope that everyone who, who viewed it will, will share it with their friends and family, inshallah. I think, I think we all feel some, you know, the light and baraka and healing happening, you know, in real time during this discussion, I can feel it, you know, mashallah. And I think, I think I'm speaking for the audience as well. Um, the comments are just coming, flooding in actually. So jazakum Allah khair to all of you who joined us and 
Um, we were really grateful to have your 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 wisdom and and your you know your knowledge and your time. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khair. Yeah. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam. And just I'll close with a couple of announcements to uh, for our audience here. Um, uh, let's see. Bismillah. Um, so you know all, we want to we want to encourage everyone to um, make sure you register for the class. Um, all of this opening session was just a preview of what's to come. We're going to have more discussions. We're going to have more Q and A. We're going to go more into the stories with Sheikh Mendez as as our as our primary teacher. But we're going to still have other guests coming in for discussions and Q and A. So what you saw tonight will be going on nine more times throughout Black History Month. This is a free class. It's a, there's a suggested donation, but it's free. Uh, there's no required payment. Um, so we urge you all to register. Last year we had four thousand families and individuals register. Uh, we already have over a thousand now, um, so we want to encourage you all to join um, this pro, you know, this program. Um, the next nine sessions as we journey through this book uh, uh, on the Black Sahaba, radiallahu anhum. Um, we also just want to uh, remind you that we are pre-selling. There's a pre-order uh, of the book um, that uh, Sheikh Talut, Sheikh Mendez translated. Um, it's in the final proofreading stages right now. It's about to be printed, and then it'll be immediately shipped out to the people who are ordering it. So by the end of February, inshallah, you will be getting this book in your hands. Um, and there are some, as you can see here, for the people who order it first, you can get some expedited shipping at a low cost. You can get free shipping if you order $100 worth because we have other stuff on the, on the store. And this coupon also applies to the first couple of hundred people who use it to save 5%. If you if you benefited from today's program, if you're feeling generous, uh, if you want, you know, these programs have costs associated with them. Friday Gems, programs like this, classes like this. Um, we have a whole team working behind the scenes. Um, if you benefit and, uh, you know, um, enjoy these programs from Celebrate Mercy and it's benefiting you and your family, please consider making a donation. No donation is too small. You can also give on a monthly basis. We are sustained primarily through donations, monthly donors, one-time donors. Um, so you make the difference. Because of you who donate, these programs are possible. So, And those who give, by the way, those who sign up to donate $30 or more, um, they uh, get free access to all of the paid programs. So any, any of the programs that have a cost, if you're giving $30 or more per month, you get access to those for free. Um, so that's one of the perks of being a monthly donor. Of course, this is all a sadaqa, jariya, and sometimes people even give on behalf of a loved one who has passed away as well. Don't forget this Friday, we have Sheikh Abedallah uh, joining us for Friday Gems. We have the link. The link is up now and ready, thanks to our sister, Sara Bilal. You can now RSVP for Friday Gems. Uh, right now at celebratemercy.com slash RSVP. We'll be sharing more about the topic of his virtual lesson um, for Friday. It'll be an amazing program, inshallah. Um, and lastly, we want to remind you guys that after COVID-19, we as an as a organization will resume taking groups uh, to Jerusalem and to Mecca and to Medina. We started this a, a couple of years ago where we started taking groups from Jordan, to Jerusalem, to Mecca, and to Medina with scholars like uh, Sheikh Mendez, uh, Sheikh Hisham Mahmoud. Um, we had Sheikh Aisha Prime with us. Uh, we had uh, Ustad Mahdi Amin. Um, it was an amazing journey that we took, and we're going to do this more often once it's safer to travel again. If you're interested in these trips, just visit celebratemercy.com slash trips. Maybe some of the people watching joined us on those trips or on that trip. So let us know in the comments. Tell tell the rest of the audience how much you benefited from that trip. Uh, you can post it in the comments. If you're interested in these trips, go to celebratemercy.com slash trips. Give us, uh, you know, uh, there's an interest form. Give us your information. And as soon as we have a new trip, we will inform you. And by the way, if you can't afford these trips, we also have scholarships to help facilitate for those who can't afford a trip like this to be able to join us. We have so many generous donors 
who are helping to make these trips happen, classes happen for those who can't afford the classes, for those who can't afford the trips. Uh, in fact, um, we, we, we were scheduling a trip recently and a large portion of all the, of all the people who joined us were actually uh, there on a scholarship. So don't let finances again be a, uh, a, me, a you know, a, a, a cause you hesitancy in signing up for the interest form, filling out the interest form for those trips, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair to everyone who joined us. We hope you'll join us for the rest of this 10 part series. Keep the Celebrate Mercy uh, board members, their families, their staff, the volunteers, and the donors, keep them all in your prayers. And, and we pray that Allah counts this as a sadaqa jariya, um, that this, this YouTube video, this, by the way, today's program will be on YouTube, on Celebrate Mercy's YouTube channel. So let your friends know they can watch it there. Um, and hopefully it'll encourage them to get the book and to sign up for the full class. Um, and while you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos and live streams. Jazakumullah khair to all of you who joined us. And I'm sorry we went way over time, but the following sessions will be limited to 90 minutes, inshallah. That is our plan um, as we go through the book with Sheikh Mendez, inshallah. It won't be as long as tonight was, but it was a beautiful introduction. And may Allah bless all the teachers who joined us and all who helped facilitate it. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you all for joining. We look forward to seeing you in our future programs and classes. Uh, like the Black Lives Are on the Messenger and the Portrait of the Prophet class as well. Jazakumullah khair. Take care, everyone. And salamu alaikum.